This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. She's known as the Grand Dame of Palafox. For more than 90 years, she has served as a centerpiece of civic pride and a showplace of the lively arts. She's the historic Sanger Theater, and if you happen to find yourself in downtown Pensacola, you'll discover her right in your own backyard. It's the holiday season, and at the Sanger Theater, it's getting close to showtime. Tonight's performance is sold out, and the building is beginning to fill up. In showbiz lingo, a theater is known as a house, and in the front of the house, the lobby that is, ticket supervisor Jean Marie Jones is ready to welcome the public and take their tickets. More often than not, Jean Marie is the first face people see as they arrive. And for her, the Sanger is not so much a house as it is a home. I've been here 29 years, will be 30 come February. These people are my extended family, and that's the way it is for all of us. We're just one big family. An hour before the evening's event, the doors to the auditorium remain closed as the Pensacola Children's Chorus takes the stage to do a quick touch-up rehearsal. Thanks to renovations and expansions, there's plenty of room in the once cramped lobby for patrons to enjoy each other's company. There's room as well for pre-show gatherings in the adjacent conference areas. On this December evening, the Children's Chorus will appear with the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. They will be joined by a special guest who got her start with the chorus and symphony on the Sanger stage back in the 1990s. Broadway star Ashley Brown has come home for the holidays. Well, it's amazing. You know, it brings back so many memories of my childhood, being with the Children's Chorus. I performed my high school musicals here, and you know, it's what it's all about to remember where you come from and, and who you are. And so it was really, really special to be in these same walls. With their rehearsal completed, the children exit the stage. Excitement is in the air as the audience enters the grand theater space. It isn't just the anticipation of enjoying world-class, homegrown talent in live performance. It's also the experience of the Sanger herself. When the theater first opened in the 1920s, downtown Pensacola was the focal point of community life and culture. Ornate and architecturally magnificent, the Spanish Baroque Sanger rivaled the opulence of the Pensacola Opera House, a famous 19th century structure that had been demolished a few years earlier. Appropriately enough, salvaged materials from the old Opera House were used when the Sanger was built as a movie palace and vaudeville stage. The fortunes of both the city and the Sanger waxed and waned during the many decades that followed. But now, in the early 21st century, the downtown area is once again vibrant and full of life. The Grand Dame of Palafox, Lady Sanger herself, has led the way in revitalizing the urban core. Occasions such as this evening provide thousands with the opportunity to celebrate it. It's the most wonderful time of the year. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you, feel good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. At a time of year when many businesses slow down, the pace of show business can be almost frenetic. Typically, the Sanger's December schedule is jam-packed. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make it come together. Earlier in the month, we caught up with the man in charge of ensuring that it all happens smoothly. 
Well, it's a busy day at the Sanger Theater, so you may hear a little set construction going on in the background. Always, always busy around here. And Doug Lee certainly knows that as he's been with the Sanger for the better part of four decades. He's really, truly worked his way up through the ranks, so to speak, and has been the general manager for many years. Welcome, Doug. Welcome, Sherry. We've got a show coming in. Yeah, you know, the Sanger works a lot of event days, but in between all those event days are all the setup days. Uh, and today we're setting up for some events coming up this weekend. Typically, we're busy about 360 days a year. So, Doug, it's probably safe to say that most people that come to see a performance have no idea what goes into that. What does it take to make a performance happen here? Well, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that, that go on here. You know, the Sanger has uh, about 200 lighting instruments, all about 1,000 watts apiece. So there's about 200,000 watts of light that come in. That's enough to power, you know, a, a pretty good sized residential block of, of homes, uh, as well as sound equipment and scenery. You know, for some shows like the symphony, it's a matter of just setting up an orchestra shell and having basic light. And other Broadway shows that come in, there can be four or five large semi-trucks that have to be unloaded, all with scenery and costumes and uh, additional lighting, sound. Uh, so it can be anything from a few hours to set up for the symphony to um, all day with a crew of 40 to 60 men. That would be for a big Broadway for show. For a big Broadway show, yes. And there was a day that these trucks didn't even have a place really to, to pull into. Um, that's been improved and modernized. Yeah, before our most recent renovation, we uh, basically had to unload all the trucks out onto the sidewalk and then roll everything into the building. Some other things that have been improved, the children's course with so many children that used to have to be bussed up to one of the local churches to change. How has that changed? We were actually able to add an additional 30,000 square feet of building uh, next to the, the Sanger on the south end. Uh, and that in included 10 new dressing rooms and wardrobe spaces and then some backstage areas just to have a place to put the kids when they weren't on the stage. Tell us a little bit about the history, if you would. Back in the 20s, how unusual was it for somebody to be able to experience um, a magnificent theater like this? Well, you think about the history of Pensacola, you know, Pensacola wasn't a real big town back in the 20s. Uh, so a building like this was pretty unusual in the, uh, the world of Pensacola of the time. Well, the Sanger was uh, opened April 2nd of 1925. Uh, it was built by the Sanger Amusement Company as a new build theater. Uh, the Sanger Amusement Company did some renovations of theaters and turned them into vaudeville houses, uh, and they did some new builds. Back in the day that the Sanger Amusement Company ran the building themselves, they would hire groups of vaudeville acts and basically stagger them one day apart. So one day you were playing in Mobile, and then you'd get on the train and come over to Pensacola for the next day, and they just rotated the acts around to the various buildings. The theater opened to a sold out house. Uh, we like those. Uh, they had some local talent. And then they had the first silent movie uh, in the theater. It was actually the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments, but the silent version, not the one that we all think of today with Charlton Heston. This was an earlier version. An earlier version. So went through the silent movie era and then into the talkies. Yeah, we went in, we, the, the theater at the time, uh, went through a period of uh, graduating to talkies uh, and then into uh, the big musicals. And in, in the 40s, uh, and particularly during World War II, uh, the theater ran 24 hours a day to provide a source of news because radio was the only other news outlet other than the newspaper. Uh, but more importantly, the Navy Yard at the time was running it in three shifts. So people were working 24 hours a day. And so the theater opened also 24 hours a day so that the people that work in shifts could actually go in and have some entertainment uh, to help with the morale during the war. Then eventually, as downtown began to get uh, a little tired and the malls opened up in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the theater and most of downtown went into a period of decline. Uh, and they started showing not really first-run movies, and in fact, some that we don't like to talk about any longer. Of course not. Uh, and then basically the theater fell into pretty much disrepair, and ABC Theaters decided to donate the property to the city. 
Uh, and the city originally intended to make the property into a parking garage. Uh, fortunately, there was a group of citizens that got together and said, you know, this is a great space, and it has something that nowhere else in town has. It had a pipe organ. And that organization got together, uh, asked the city for the pipe organ, and the city said, sure, take it. Uh, we're going to tear the building down anyway. Well, eventually they went back to the city and said, you know, there's no other place to put it. It's such a huge, magnificent instrument that there's no other place in town to put it, so we really need to keep the building. And that really is what started the citizens' drive to keep the Sanger alive and keep it from uh, falling under the wrecking ball. And so that was a Robert Morton theater organ? Yeah, that, the, the theater organ in here is a Robert Morton uh, designed uh, console. Uh, and it uh, is a huge instrument. It's one of the finest in the Southeast. And the Friends of the Sanger have recently been working on restoring that organ back to its original uh, glory and adding additional things to it as well. Well, and take me from 1981, the Sanger was renovated to an extent. That was the year that the Sanger was officially reopened? That's correct. We reopened September 26th of 1981 with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. But then didn't she start to be used for things other than had been originally intended? And how was that addressed? In 1981, the, the theory was that we would be doing a lot of community theater uh, and things that would be produced locally. Uh, as we grew, we started doing more and more touring shows, uh, a, a full Broadway series um, and concerts and things like that that needed more production space than a local show does. In addition, our local organizations grew. Uh, the, the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra, which is one of the oldest symphonies in the nation, it needed more things to support its quality. Uh, an orchestra shell uh, that would then re reflect the sound from the stage out into the audience, where before that, all the curtains above the stage absorbed a lot of the sound and you didn't hear the symphony to its fullest. Uh, we also developed an opera company in Pensacola. Uh, and it has grown considerably, and it needed more things that the Sanger just couldn't do back then. We just didn't have a big enough orchestra pit. We didn't have anywhere to put sets backstage. The dressing rooms, uh, those things needed to be done. So a few years ago, a group of citizens got together again with the Friends of the Sanger uh, and raised $15 million with the help of the county and the city, uh, grants and other donations and did a major renovation and historic preservation to the theater, uh, and then we reopened about five years ago. Doug, I'm sure there are other things that we'll want to come back to in this conversation, but maybe we'll get a chance to walk around and see a few of the things we've talked about. That sounds great. Doug, the view from up here is magnificent, really something not too many people will see unless they are planning to operate the light booth up here. Um, let's talk a little bit about what goes on in this area of the theater. Well, this and other rooms like it are scattered out through the theater, and this is where actually the magic happens. This uh, is the lighting control station for our stage lighting. Uh, this is where we control those 200 lights we were talking about. Uh, the operator would sit here during the show and manipulate all the lighting either in a live setting with the controls here or in a pre-recorded thing like most Broadway shows have where the lights are already written into a computer program and then they're played back at the moment in time it needs to happen during the show. Doug, another view that uh, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to experience um, is the view from the stage. I know there are a number of events that are held up here from time to time to give people that opportunity, but let's talk about this magnificent stage, the, the place that most of the performers will see that most of the audience will not see. Well, we're seeing it really at a time that most people don't get to see it, and that's when there's not actually a show going on and we're setting up for the next one. Uh, there's a lot of things up here that are really kind of neat uh, to know, like this floor we're standing on is the original 1925 hardwood floor that was installed when the building was first built. The portion that's just in front of us is actually made of hardwood and it was designed for tap dancing. And then the area that's back a little further is made of softwood and that's because sometimes scenery is attached to the floor using stage screws. There have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows in here uh, with all kinds of big heavy objects, everything from ballet dancers to elephants have been across this floor. And right now we have an orchestra shell going in. Yeah, this shell that you see going in uh, 
is actually then masking all of the areas in the back of the theater that sound would be absorbed in. So again, it's all focused out toward the audience. Also, it allows the players to hear themselves better from the person that's sitting on this side of the stage to the one that's sitting on the far side of the stage. They can hear themselves better, both because of the shell and the ceiling that's installed. Uh, the ceiling, by the way, is about 6,000 pounds uh, hung above the orchestra's head. Uh, and then after the symphony's gone, we'll actually take that down and store it in the back. The curtains, there are a number of curtains, but the main curtain, that had to be replaced. We did indeed replace the main curtain, and uh, before the renovation, it was still the original curtain from 1925. Unfortunately, after that many years, it was just threadbare and wouldn't hold up under its own weight, so it had to be replaced. But we did save the bottom gold fringe just for historic preservation. That's great. And then there's rigging. Above us is about 62 feet of airspace in which the backdrops, you know, when you see it come down to the stage, it fills what you can see. But then when that backdrop goes away, there has to be enough ceiling above for it to go all the way up and, and go out of sight. So there's 62 feet above us all the way up to the top of the, the grid. We talked about a big renovation and addition that happened back 2008 or so. Yes. And you know, one of the things that we talked about was how small it was in the, the theater. You can see right here, this is the edge of the stage and it came just a few feet and then you were at the wall. There was nowhere to go. So in this renovation, we actually added this space that we're walking into uh, and it provided a place that the actors, once you leave the stage and you're making that big leap off uh, as a dancer, you had somewhere to go because otherwise you leaped off and hit the wall. So we provided a space over here. It also then uh, allowed us to build new dressing rooms uh, for the performers uh, with their all restroom, shower, equipped all up to the, the current standards that are necessary for professional uh, performers. This is a space for the trucks to pull in, or, or what do we have right yeah, here? Yeah, back behind us as well, in addition to providing space for the actors, we provided a space that trucks could then back up undercover uh, and unload two trucks at a time without having to dump everything out onto the sidewalk and then try to roll it in. We happen to be here during the lovely and festive holiday season. This area in itself has some history. Yeah, in about 1995, we undertook a project with the Friends of the Sanger to expand the lobby space, a new two-story lobby uh, that incorporates some additional restrooms, uh, some additional pre-function area, and also some areas that receptions can be held in. When we did the renovation just a few years ago, we added additional lobby on the south side of the building as well as a 3,000 square foot meeting room. Doug, we talked earlier about the great Sanger pipe organ, its early history and the process that it's in now. What are, what are we looking at here? Well, behind us is the actual pipe organ chamber above the box seat, that area that's framed out with all the plaster work. Uh, that's actually where the sound is generated from the organ through the w pipes that are actually in that large room and then the wind that's generated that actually makes the sound. And that's what saved the, s the building from the wrecking ball. That's correct. Well, very interesting. And we had a chance to talk with some of the organ builders about the process that a theater organ undergoes to become up and operational once again. In April of the theater's 90th year, the great Sanger pipe organ rose dramatically from the orchestra pit. The event marked a high point in a multi-year effort to revive the instrument that had literally been a part of the Sanger since it came into being. Pipe organs are interesting because you're not just playing the instrument, you're playing the building. The building itself and its natural acoustics are an integral part of the sound that the organ makes. And so the organist is playing literally the building. And sometimes the floors will shake as part of the performance. A group of donors were serenaded in a private premiere. It was the Friends of the Sanger's way of showing appreciation for their invaluable support. The restoration of this particular organ, uh, the process was faced with some tremendous goals. Large components, such as pipes and wind chests, were acquired and refurbished. 
The materials were loaded into the Sanger and carried up to the organ loft. We don't have large openings in the chambers, so basically every pipe has been carried by hand from trays out in the theater through the small openings, and we are piece by piece rebuilding this organ. This is a process that does take a long time, and it'll be fine-tuned and updated and upgraded multiple times. Heavy physical labor was involved, as well as no small amount of daring in climbing the Sanger's ladders and negotiating the catwalks at a dizzying height above the stage floor. The restoration project has a broad base of support in the local music community. I'm sure there are a lot of people who have never heard of theater organ. I think it can be a tourist attraction uh, because uh, it's, it's unique. There just aren't many places that have a, a playable theater organ. The city should be very proud of the fact that this instrument has not been lost. So many other towns and other theaters have lost these great instruments of history. And ours not only has been preserved, but now actually even improved to the point where that it's a magnificent instrument. Just a few weeks after its private premiere, the pipe organ was featured in a masterworks performance of the Organ Symphony. The Sanger Theater itself, historic theater, such an important part of Pensacola, and so many things have happened. There's such a rich history around this theater, and it's really just in its prime right now since the great renovation that happened a few years ago. And it's busy and it's booked all the time, but the organ is such an essential part of the concept of a theater from this era and of the kinds of events that this theater can be hosting. And so, Great as the renovation is and great as the theater is right now, this is really, in a sense, the crowning achievement to get this organ back into place. Now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Sanger was built at a cost of $500,000 which was real money in the 1920s. The balcony rests on what was said at the time to be the largest girder ever brought into the state of Florida. But in constructing the Sanger, another great theater was given a resurrection of sorts. Well, actually in the 20s when this building was built, uh, there were the remnants of the Pensacola Opera House that had been destroyed by a hurricane a few years earlier. And they re-salvaged all of the brick and used it for about two-thirds of the brick that the Sanger's actually made of. So when you look at the outside of the building, you'll see about two-thirds of the way up, it changes color. And that's because they used 1925 brick when they ran out of the original 1880s brick. In addition, the balcony rail, the ornamental iron balcony rail that you see in the theater now, actually was reclaimed from that opera house. Well, you know, in the 20s uh, in architecture in the U.S., there was a tremendous revival of trying to make things look like European palaces and that sort of thing. And indeed, they did that here, but with a little bit of American whimsy. Uh, when you look through the theater, you'll see uh, various what look like wood carvings or stone carvings. And actually, those are done in plaster rather than wood, but they're painted to look like they're, you know, much more uh, stout things. If you look around, there are various faces in the theater. What looks like the picture of a, a Roman soldier with a, a ornament on his helmet. And if you look closely, that, uh, that ornament is not actually anything other than a lizard on his head. Uh, there's a lot of nice features in the building, though, that are pretty subtle. For example, all the chandeliers in here are Tiffany glass, uh, leaded glass. Uh, and by the way, they're all original in here, uh, as well as the exit lights are Tiffany glass. Uh, you know, they spent a lot of time on details that you just don't see in buildings today. All the, the elements in the building that you look at that appear to be gold up in the ceiling in that area are actually gold leaf. As well, back when the building was first built, the movie screen, you know, we call it the silver screen, and that's because it had eight pounds of silver dust on it. When the building was built, there was no air conditioning in the building at all. The only ventilation system were some fans mounted up on the roof uh, that then pulled 
air up through the seating area and then exhausted it up to the roof. And so when you look up at the, the ceiling in the theater now, you'll see some kind of uh, uh, basket weave look uh, ventilation areas. Those have been converted to air conditioning, uh, but originally they were exhaust vents. When the Sanger was first built, Pensacola was still very much a part of the Old South, and it remained that way for decades. Well, as most theaters and other buildings in the, the 20s, uh, this, the Sanger was built to be segregated. Uh, it's a very unfortunate part of our history, but that's the way it actually was. And there was a separate entrance on the south side of the building that various ethnic groups were required to use. Uh, people of African descent were sent there, people of uh, Cajun descent were sent there. When I was growing up, it was segregated, and the Sanger was the best theater for us to attend. However, segregation time, we had to come in from the side door, and we occupied the upstairs, the upper balcony. I think the Sanger is going to be around for another hundred years, at least in our community. We have a, a community that loves the arts, that supports the arts, and really sees a value in arts and arts education. And I think as long as the Sanger is supplying that location for the arts to flourish, we have a long and prosperous history. The holiday concert embodied the growth and evolution of the theater over the better part of a century. The Sanger's expansions and renovations not only meet the needs of an excellent and thriving local arts community, but they attract Broadway-level talent as well. Pensacola's Sanger Theater has more than filled the lead role played by the Opera House a century earlier. It's a beautiful space where citizens can assemble for a spectacle of sight and sound. Getting to the Pensacola Sanger Theater is easy. From Interstate 10, take I-110 south to the Cervantes Street exit. Go west and then take the first left onto Palafox Street. Travel down the hill into the downtown area. Go across Garden Street and in just a couple of blocks, you'll see the theater on your left. Parking is available in a variety of locations, but the nearby Jefferson Street parking garage is especially convenient. We hope you enjoyed getting to know Lady Sanger, the Grand Dame of Palafox. We'll see you again next time, right in your own backyard.